Hi, I'm Rob Cosman. Welcome to my shop. This is another piece of Rob Cosman furniture. It's my big ass desk. Built this back in the 1980s. Lots of interesting details about it. I'm going to share them with you. Stay with us. I'm Rob Cosman and welcome to my shop. We make it our job to help take your woodworking to the next level. If you're new to our channel, make sure you subscribe and hit the notification bell, which will alert you whenever we release a new video. Anytime we use a new tool or technique, we'll leave a description down below so that make it easier for you to find. All right, let's get back to work. So the story behind this big ash desk it was 1988. I had just spent part of the summer of 1987 working as an assistant to Alan Peters. Now, if you don't know who Alan Peters is, do some research on that because I think he was probably the premier design, furniture designer craftsman of the last century. And Alan used a lot of big slabs, kept it very simple. Joinery was always a, a major feature. And uh, I just learned through wedge tenons and dovetails and was enamored by it. I also uh, worked as Dale Nish's assistant at BYU, and Dale uh, was a lover of wood, and he had all kinds of stuff squirreled away, and I managed to find it. So there was this huge piece of ash that had been locally cut, slabbed out, and it was dry. I also found some big walnut, and this is what uh, became of it. Now, before I get into the details, I'll just give you the dimensions real quick. There were some limitations that we had to work around. I'll explain those as well, but what we finished with... Ended up being 61 and a quarter inches long. The top is 21 inches wide. That top piece of ash finished out at inch and seven eighths. And the height I believe is 29, 29 inches. So what I'll do is I'll walk you through a little bit of the history of it. Um, I just recently refinished the top, the face, the edges, the parts that were easy to get at. The rest of it, you can see how it has oxidized over the years. But I'll share with you what, something that happened to it that almost destroyed it, and then we'll go through the actual details and some of the things that I thought were unique to it. I forgot to mention the finish. When I originally built this, I had sprayed it with a product called Fuller Plast. That was, I, I can't even remember the specifics of it, but it was a clear finish, it stunk, uh, but it was very hard when it dried and it uh, was waterproof. It was a great finish. I don't have access to that now. So in refinishing, I simply sprayed it with lacquer, same lacquer that I use all the time here, and I had taken it down to the bare wood. So there wasn't a problem of whether or not the lacquer would adhere to the original finish. I used masking tape and craft paper to mask off all the areas that weren't going to be sprayed. And like I said, all of the areas that get sprayed with the lacquer here were taken down to the bare wood. Now, what woods we used, we already know ash on the top, black walnut on the sides, and that was one solid piece, as was this. Um, black walnut on the sides of the cabinet, ash on the dividers. Interestingly enough, these drawer fronts are quarter sawn, and I had access to what are called backer boards. So in a veneer mill, where they take a log that's been cut down through the center, they clamp onto it, and then they, there's a knife that starts slicing off sheets of veneer. Well, back whenever, the clamps would, would uh, you couldn't get much closer than about an inch to the center. In other words, the clamps were holding on in such a way that you'd have about a one inch thick board left over. And what was nice about that one inch board, it was cut right down through the center, so it was quartersawn on, e quarter on either side of the center of the tree. Made beautiful wood, so that's what the drawer fronts are made out of, and the back panels, and of course the drawer fronts over here as well. Uh, the only other woods, I use poplar on the drawer sides because it shows off nice on the dark pins of the pins, walnut pins, and I used uh, uh, ash plywood, quarter inch ash plywood on the bottom. If I was doing it today, I would have used solid wood, but back then I used plywood. Okay, so the design. At the time, I was taking, uh, studying design, furniture design under a man named Milo Boffman. And uh, this was in that class. I was at a real disadvantage because I got put into a third year program with students who had spent uh, two or three years learning to render and draw, and I was barely able to draw my name. So they allowed me to make scale models, and I made a scale model of this in the design process, and then I built the whole thing, and I think I got an A. Anyway. The idea was I wanted the, both sides to look the same. So you're sitting here, 
and uh, the client or customer is going to be on the other side, so it wants to be as equally as pretty. So I carried that over. But before we go to the other side, I'll just tell you this. Alan Peters used to, I love the way that he integrated the handle or the means of opening a door or drawer into the overall design of the piece without adding on a drawer pull, which I always find drawer pulls are the first thing to date something. And in this case, I just didn't want to interrupt that nice piece of a quarter sawn walnut. So I cut a recess into the divider. I cut a little finger recess up underneath each drawer so you could simply reach underneath and it was quite convenient. I'll admit these ones are a little bit difficult since you're sitting in a seat from a seated position, you've got to reach all the way underneath. And of course, this has kind of dated the piece as well because I don't think anybody actually uses file drawers anymore. So on this back side, which would be the front of the uh, desk, I used same idea, only thinner, thinner panels. And they're sitting in a groove all the way around. Of course, the ash divides them and it looks the same on both sides. I wanted the idea of uh, keeping it really simple. So if you think about it, it's nothing more than an upright. You got your piece coming across the top and you've got another upright. And I wanted those drawers to almost be suspended, which is what they are. In order to do this kind of construction, you had to have a joint that was going to be sufficiently strong that that wouldn't rack side to side. This is a heavy desk and typically you would need something, maybe a, a, a modesty panel or something going across there that would stiffen it up. But that big heavy dovetail was enough to do it. On these drawer boxes, um, again, all solid wood construction. So there's a dado cut on the underside that the top side of this piece fits into. And then there's four through wedge tenons. If I was doing it again, I might have doubled them up and put them in pairs, but this I think was going to be plenty strong enough. So this is this piece being cut down so that there's a shoulder on it where it fits into the dado cut on the underside of the top. And then this section continues all the way through. This opening or this mortise is flared like a dovetail wider on this end than it is on this side. Two cuts made in the tenon before it's put in and then ash wedges that fill that shape are glued in place and of course you end up with a very strong joint. And it was a, I mean it was a lot of chiseling cutting through that big thick piece of ash. Uh, as far as the rest of it goes, there's, uh, you can't see it because again the oxidation of the woods have, have colored it but this is all dovetailed as well so Back when it was freshly made, you could see those dovetails standing out against the ash pins on both sides as well, which if anybody's into joinery, it was always an interesting feature. Now, when we were working around, when I was working around this piece of ash, there were some flaws. And the first thing you'll notice, or if you look closely, is this being air dried, not kiln dried, it was infested with something called a powder post beetle. And uh, they go in and they make these little round holes and they really literally turn the wood into powder. And they were still alive after I had finished the desk. I would find little pyramids of powder underneath. But I had to cut off as much as I could or else I could have made this a lot wider. But I was limited by that. Uh, the other problem is that we had, some, we had some checks right here. There's a knot in the middle, so I had to fill that with epoxy. If you can't, if you can't eliminate it, rather than try to disguise it, you just highlight it. There's some cracks in here. Again, something you really couldn't do anything about, but I figured that the dovetail would hold it together. Now, next thing I want to tell you is the accident that happened that uh, darn near destroyed it, but maybe because of the construction, I actually have this piece today. Uh, 1990, I had been home for about six months and there was a furniture show happening in Halifax, Nova Scotia, which was about a four hour drive. And uh, just new in my business, not a lot of cash. I had rented a van in order to transport the various pieces of furniture down there. Got home late on a Sunday night. The van had to be returned Monday morning before eight o'clock or else you're gonna get charged another day. I got home late, so I had to get up early, unload the van. We had just moved into a new house. There was no landscaping done. We had a retaining wall that was actually part of the foundation. And it was about, it went from about six feet high down to the, down to the ground. Of course, it was eight inches wide. It was uh, not landscaped on either side, although on one side it was mud, 
On the other side, it was just a drop off down to a uh, gravel driveway. I had taken the drawers out. Uh, my children were all too small to help. And back in my young and foolish days, I had actually had hoisted this up on my shoulder and I was walking up this retaining wall carefully, balancing this thing on my shoulder, got to the top. I remember this like it happened yesterday, just as the wind blew just enough to make me lose my balance. And now I'm heading toward this six foot drop. And all this had to happen in a split second, but I thought, okay, do I try to jump with it and save it? Break my back in the process? Or do I use the momentum of throwing it to keep me from falling over, but sacrifice the bench or the desk? Well, that's what I had to choose. So it hit the ground and uh, it was a bad thud. I think it sat in my uh, house for probably two or three years, might have been longer, before I finally got over the disappointment and decided to try to fix it. I'll show you what happened as a result of, the, uh, of, the, of hitting the ground. So there's a chunk of wood missing here. There's a chunk of wood that came out here. These actually broke loose. I, uh, hard to believe, but a couple of them pulled through. Didn't fall out, but they just broke loose. Uh, they got twisted. That My drawers don't fit like that normally. If you look over here, it broke, it broke, both joints were broken loose a little bit. Uh, there's a crack that developed there. Uh, I think the rest of this side was okay. Mm -mm. No, is there another one? Oh, I just got it to light. Yeah, there's a crack there, but you know what? That may have just happened. And I just told you that that was a single piece of wood, but it isn't. I can see a joint line right there. Getting too old. This, it cracked right there. But I was able to pull that back together with clamps and I think I used cyanacrylate to, to go in there and hopefully try to re-seal uh, that joint. These, what I did is I clamped from the bottom, I pulled it up to get it back into position. I had to go in, because these all got blown apart, I had to go in and squeeze these sides together, screw them back, and then put in a wood plug so you can see some walnut wood plugs in there that uh, were a result of having to make that repair. Once I pulled up these top sections and got them tight, really couldn't go in and do anything. So I went in and I, uh, I screwed on an angle along both panels to go up into the ash to hold that in place. Down here, uh, this uh, knocked a chunk right off of this. So I had to go in and just clean that off and add a piece of ash onto there. It actually blends fairly well unless somebody points it out to you. This joint, of course, broke open as well, but same thing, pulled it back together. And this one, yes, has screws up in there as well. My mo the, the biggest disappointment was that it twisted these cases so it no longer had that fit. The drawers had been taken out, so there was no damage done to them. But they used to just work so nicely. Now you can see some side-to-side -side movement, and that was, trust me, that wasn't there when it was originally built. But I salvaged it. We still have it today. And hopefully it'll survive another 30 or 40 years if somebody else doesn't throw it off a six-foot embankment. Uh, one of the things that people often ask me is, how did you cut these big dovetails? Well, I cut them with a saw. But the problem was not cutting the tails because that's a short enough piece. You could put it in your vise and you can work on it. But how do you cut the pins when this thing stands up and it's five feet tall, which is almost as tall as me? So what I did, I had this propped up, this big slab. I had it clamped to a bench. I had, uh, I built some kind of a framework to hold it steady. And then I stood up on top of the bench to actually cut them so I could cut them at what would be normal bench height. And actually it worked out quite well. But it's a big, tough cut going through that much ash. And I didn't have great tools at the time. I know, I remember I had to modify them. The school didn't have much when it came to hand tools. Well, I say it had lots of hand tools, but they had been there for 50 years and they'd been brutalized. So I had to go in and sharpen and reshape. Now the drawers. Pretty standard based on how I do it now. Um, half blind dovetails. That drawer front, I don't know whether that's three quarter or not. It looks a little bit less than that. Is it 11 sixteenths? It is. 11 sixteenths. And did I do that? I'm trying to decide if I actually cut the drawer front off. I think I did. That might have been one of the first. Yeah, I did. So this was 
what I, I uh, took the, that's why it's 11 sixteenths actually. So before I started, I took a slice off the end of the drawer, off the face of the drawer, went ahead and built a through dovetail, which is very quick and easy to do, and then glued this piece back on. And because it came off that same piece, it pretty much hides the glue joint, but it made for a much faster half blind dovetail. I have tools now that I can do that a lot quicker, but back then that was the best solution I could come up with. Um, as I mentioned, I put plywood on the bottom, which I wish now that I'd use solid wood, but you know what? I could easily go in and change that too, which is nice about this design. Grain always ran this way, even though on plywood it doesn't matter, but traditionally it would have. My, drawer, my back, drawer back, is a little thinner than I usually do. I usually make that a little bit thicker now. My reasoning is the thicker this is, the thinner you can make your drawer sides because there's more glue surface and it makes for a stronger corner joint. It's not stressed that much unless you drop it over an embankment. So there's how I did that. I used a bullnose bit to just cut out that recess. The drawer is sitting in here. It's sitting in a little bit of a rabbit that I had to cut in order to get it to fit. And there's two screws, of course, with plywood, you don't have to worry about movement, so that's how it sits. Not bad dovetails for somebody that had just started. I don't think there's anything different in any of these. Um, looking back now, having had this kicking around our house for the past uh, 30 plus years, it's nice to actually make your drawers so that you can replace the drawer bottom. That's the part that gets dirty and spilled on. So in lieu of gluing that in, have it so that you can simply take those two screws out, take that drawer bottom out, either refinish it or replace it, and it freshens everything up. Now I'm just gonna take this, I'm sometimes curious as to how I built this because it's been so long ago I don't remember, but I do remember having to deal with cross grain grain construction. So this big walnut side panel is gonna have a tendency to move a fair bit. And the frames, let me take this out and get a little more light in there. The frames are made out of uh, ash on the front and on the back and poplar in between. So the way I built this, this frame is essentially a stable um, piece of construction. It's not going to move in any direction. But you're fastening, against, fastening it against something that is going to move. The other problem is you don't want you don't want any movement that's going to interrupt this interface or the same thing on the other side. So this piece of poplar is a mortise and tenon and glued to this front piece. On the back side, that piece of poplar is dry fit into a groove cut on this back piece. And uh, it's, it's allowed to move along that, it's, there's no glue in here, it's just sitting in a dado. It's, and it's actually housed, so there's a shoulder on both sides, so it's a nice tight fit. But as this expands out that way, this can go that in that direction. The tongue on the end of this piece will keep it in place up and down, but it allows that to move out or to come in depending on the season. So you're not restricting your movement at all. It's uh, a little bit of sacrifice. In other words, by the way, this piece is this back piece of ash that you see on the on the face side is actually fastened mortise and tenon into this piece so it stays put the only thing that changes is the gap between the end of this runner and this piece of ash back here you can see more evidence of the the worm infestation i was trying to use wood out of the same board in order to do everything and the bottom is a, is a solid piece of ash as well but uh, I was asked recently, do you, have to, do, do you have to be careful with different expansion rates when you're using two different types of wood? So here's a piece of uh, walnut that measures, I think it's 19, 18 inches wide up against an 18 inch wide piece of ash. There's not enough difference in movement going with the two or 3% moisture change that's gonna happen seasonally to make enough of a difference to give you any kind of a problem. So I don't think you ever have to worry about uh, different, more, different movement rates between two species of hardwood in a, set, in a setting like that. Of course, the other one is exactly the same. So there you have it, that's the big ash desk. If you enjoy my method of work and like my style of teaching, 
click on any one of these videos to help take your woodworking to the next level. Now I've always said, better tools make the job so much easier. If you click on the icon with the plane and the chisel, it'll take you to our website, introduce you to all of our tools that we actually manufacture right here, as well as our workshops, both in person and online. Good luck.